Thank you, Mr. Gibbs. Thank you, Ms. Grossman. I'm happy to be here. For decades, we've watched as the criminal justice system went off the rails. No big city has done worse than Philadelphia, where the rate of incarceration exceeds all the other big cities. Few states have done worse than Pennsylvania, where the rate of incarceration exceeds the national average. What we've seen has been a radical experiment in over-prosecution, over-incarceration, and systemic racism. It has been power stepping on the necks of the poor. And the experiment has not worked. It has destroyed communities, neighborhoods, families, and so many individuals, but it has not worked. It has drained billions from education and infrastructure, but it has not worked. It has been unjust and torn us apart, but it has not made us safe. Over-prosecution, over-sentencing. Thousands of people sitting in jail for lack of cash bail, waiting for a justice system that is clogged with minor cases while homicides go unsolved and victims are used and thrown away. Cars, cash, homes seized from poor people who are not charged or convicted of anything, but lose their assets because they cannot afford to fight. A generation of our kids, and they are all our kids, illegally stopped and humiliated for doing nothing wrong unless being poor and young, and usually black or brown, is wrong. Well, it isn't. The relationship between the communities where those kids live and police has become toxic. And yet we are not safer, and it is not just. There are so many great prosecutors and great police in Philadelphia. They are not the problem. The culture in which they work is the problem, a culture that allowed corruption at every level. It will take someone from the outside who knows that culture well to change it. It will take someone who has pushed for fair trials and has pushed against corruption and brutality that insiders excused to change it. 30 years of criminal court, county public defender, federal public defender, private practice for 25 years, often four to five days per week, thousands of trials, tens of thousands of clients in Philadelphia and 25 years of civil rights law have permitted me that background close relationships with prosecutors and police officers developed over those years whose cell numbers are in this cell phone. They have given me that background and my own experience as a victim of crime who was assaulted and slashed in the face in Philadelphia and my experience of representing victims of crime who frequently had their needs ignored by prosecutors eager to use their testimony but far less eager to actually provide them with assistance has given me that background. So I look forward to working with the great people in the district attorney's office, old hands and newcomers, to do from the inside the same thing that I've been doing during my career from the outside, and that is to seek justice. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Price. Well, I think the first thing that I would say is hello to the dozens of them whom I know well, some of whom have been there 30 years, some of whom have been there too. That's one of the things that happens when you're a private practitioner. You don't just get assigned to one courtroom and hang around with one judge. You see all the judges and you see all the prosecutors because you're doing cases that range anywhere from a triple murder to underage drinking. So I would say hello to the, to the many people I know there and I would make sure that they understand very clearly that the mission is to seek justice. It's always been to seek justice, but that justice not, needs to be viewed more broadly that justice includes understanding that when you just keep putting people in jail, that that's a money fire, and that that money cannot go to fund public schools, and that money cannot go for drug treatment, and that money cannot go for job training or economic development, that there is a cost and there is a benefit to every year that you keep a person in custody. That is a part of this equation that's been completely lost, and it is no part of the current culture of the district attorney's office, hasn't been for 30 years. So we would start with the basic which is that with each decision we are to seek justice but justice includes things like what is happening to our public schools and what is happening to these young men who at 16 feel so hopeless and desperate that they drop out of school and they pick up a gun that is how you approach the problem you approach criminal justice from a perspective of prevention of understanding that resources especially in the poorest of the 10 largest cities but in all cities are limited and that we have to make a decision about whether a year in jail is really necessary. Many times it is, and many times it is not. And the crucial thing is to be able to distinguish between those who need to be in jail and those who don't, and be able to use those resources which are enormous in ways that are more effective. That would be the beginning of our discussion, and we would have a long way to go from there. Ms. Grossman, thank you. I have the pleasure 
of speaking to Elizabeth Holtzman, who was famously a progressive district attorney in Brooklyn in the early 1970s, late 1960s, uh, and faced a lot of the issues that unfortunately I think we face today in Philadelphia. This was before she became, became a member of the U.S. House of Representatives. And she explained to me that when she came to be the DA in Brooklyn, she set up a separate unit to investigate matters involving the police because she thought it was very difficult for prosecutors who routinely work with police as witnesses and investigators to come back and prosecute them. She said the consequence of that was that when she ran for re-election, her opponent ran on the platform of eliminating that unit and had strong support from the police union. There is a very unfortunate history of certain police unions essentially standing for the notion that police should not be accountable. Um, that's wrong. Everybody is accountable. There is an even standard in the law, and politics should not change that even standard. Fortunately, she did well enough that she was not only able to survive, but she you know, was able to advance to other offices where she did some pretty great progressive things. Philadelphia, let me just give you a couple snippets here. You remember Jack Baird? Jack Baird was a corrupt narcotics officer who went to jail for 13 years. He was prosecuted by the feds because he was not prosecuted by the county, by the DA's office. They had no problem with it. But he had been investigated 23 times by internal affairs and exonerated 23 times on accusations of planning evidence and so on. There is a very long and entrenched history ever since Frank Rizzo of the police department's internal affairs unit covering up for police corruption and brutality, and there's a very long history of this Philadelphia District Attorney's Office doing exactly the same. One of the advantages of being an attorney who's brought over 75 civil matters against, uh, usually against police, for brutality or corruption is that I have a level of credibility in this regard. I did what was politically unthinkable, frankly, for all of those years, and now it turns out that the public has come around and they understand that. So I feel Thank that you, I, am, I feel I'm uniquely situated to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, um, I'm also endorsed by the Guardian Civic League, which is the historic, historically black police union, which uh, did not choose to endorse my opponent. So the notion that there is some sort of a unanimity uh, among police, where they all feel the same way because certain words come out of the mouth of the leader of the FOP, I think is frankly false. The leader of the FOP also referred to black activists as quote rabid animals unquote. At a, process, at a press conference where I was not invited and where my opponent attended. Um, so, you know, there is no particular reason to assume that just because the head of the FOP says certain things that all the good officers I know with whom I am friendly necessarily feel that way. Now, Asa Khalif is an outspoken activist, but he is not an official head of Black Lives Matter. In fact, there are deep divisions within that group, just as there is no uniformity within police officers. And he has used his First Amendment rights to say and do things uh, with which I may or may not agree at times. I mean, the fact is that I represented him and I've represented many people in Black Lives Matter just as I represented ACT UP and Occupy and clergy and all sorts of other people, including uh, victims groups and people who were opposed to gun violence because I believe in their free speech rights. I didn't do it because I necessarily agreed with every tactic they used or everything they said. So, you know, I feel that ultimately the good cops feel the same way I do, which is they hate bad cops. Because bad cops make them look bad, they endanger them, they take their promotions, they take their overtime, and they would like to have a clean house, just as lawyers do not complain when Seth Williams goes to jail because he did dirt. That's how it should be. He should be accountable. It doesn't matter whether you got a uniform or not, that's just how it is. So I actually think I have very broad support among police officers who stand for integrity, which I believe the vast majority do, and who don't stand for racism, which I also believe the vast majority do. Um, and I think that, that says a lot about why it is the Guardian Civic League has supported me and why I have good relationships with the last two commissioners. So the reason we actually have about 27 diversionary programs is it's a career builder. It allows certain people in the court system to take credit for it and put it on their resume. It's actually very inefficient. We should probably be not going down to five or six. It's not, frankly, too dissimilar to what has happened with the administration at the DA's office where they went from about 12 supervisors for 300 attorneys to about 59 supervisors over the space of eight years. That was not anything that was actually done for a good reason. That was done because certain people like certain people a certain way. And that's how you get to the place where you have gridlock because you have one supervisor for every five attorneys. So frankly, I think that that whole 27 diversionary program thing is meaningless. A lot of them should be consolidated and synthesized. It would be much more efficient. Second, the great gaps in diversion have been number one, the refusal to give it in cases where it really should have been given. And number two, the refusal to give it in a meaningful way 
for people who are suffering from mental health issues or people who really aren't deserving of a second chance. We have far too many 18 and 20 year olds who get a felony conviction and because of that felony conviction they're debilitated from jobs for life. And that of course means that they're not gonna perform in a family the same way, they may not own a home, they will inevitably be turned into a cycle of poverty and back toward crime. That's what we're doing, we're actually creating a crime by not giving young people who've made a mistake or a couple mistakes, even if they involve something as serious as selling a small amount of drugs, we're not giving them a second chance and the results are absolutely devastating. It makes us less safe. So where this needs to go is to have a broader and more meaningful form of diversion that is actually given. We have something like that in the juvenile justice system. And I'll give you a very fast story about this. I met a guy years after I represented him who had four drug cases in a month as a juvenile. And years later, after he'd gone to juvenile custody, pleading guilty to all these cases, he was a gas worker with a family and a house and five kids and living with the mother of all five, but only because as a juvenile, there were forms of diversion available that are not available to adults. So I've had the good fortune of being able to visit with Kim Ogg, who is the new progressive DA in Houston, and Kim Fox, who's the new progressive DA in um, Chicago and a few others, including the DA in Corpus Christi. And I've asked these questions of them, or qu similar questions. Um, what I am seeing, which makes sense to me, is that it's really run more in, the, in a cabinet style, meaning there are six, seven, eight, or 10 close confidants with specialties. Chicago, for example, is 1,200 employees, which is bigger. It's twice as big as what we have here, and the first assistant there is a career labor attorney. Well, that actually makes a lot of sense. You know, I think that, that going at this with a certain level of creativity, not following a structure in an organization that has frankly had a failing report card for a couple decades makes some sense. And I would much rather operate off a model that looks like a cabinet of people who are trusted, who share the same values, but who also have very specific expertise is the most important thing. There is no way that one person can really see what's happening in every courtroom with every assistant. So it will be absolutely crucial to have the best possible people based upon a local search, but also a national search, taking advantage of the best people in the office in those positions. There is no leader who's gonna be any better than that circle of people. Well, I mean, here's the reality. In a country where one in three black men experience jail, but only one in 17 white men experience jail, being a DA is not always the first thing on the mind of an African-American law student. That's just reality, and there's a reason for that. And the reason is that there's a very long history of DA's offices being uh, fundamentally, systemically racist and carrying out policies that have very bad racial implications. It becomes a totally different situation if you have a district attorney who is committed to running an office that is progressive and can therefore attract on a national basis candidates who would not have even considered being a district attorney in that location previously. This is exactly the experience that Elizabeth Holtzman had in Brooklyn. She was able to do things like attract people from, frankly, some of the most prestigious law schools around the country who never would have thought of it previously. She was able to get a professor from Yale to become the head of her appeals division. All of this becomes possible when there is something for young idealistic people and also for people of color and also for women to believe in because it is a different vision of how you prosecute and it's a different vision of what you do. It's not more of the same in a city where the, you know, one of our DAs was known as the queen of death. It's not more of that. So fundamentally, I think the point is you have to be the change. And if you are the change, then you will be able to attract the best candidates from all over, which means you'll have a tremendously diverse pool of people to pick from. Thank you. Very concretely, uh, there is a huge criminal justice reform movement in the United States. And I've been lucky enough to be allowed contact with that group of people. They're on both coasts. They have a tremendous network of extremely skilled people, and they have an awful lot of young law students who are very interested. Courses are taught now on mass incarceration, a phrase I didn't even know 10 years ago, all right? So by being a part of that, I have the ability electronically and also by going to law schools, which we're already starting to do and have committed to do, to recruit these amazing talents. I got an email from the, the first African-American. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Thank you. 30 seconds. These 30 seconds. So um, this is one way in which Donald Trump is like the district attorney's office. Because the DA's office has a long record of messing with the independence of the judiciary by bullying. And Donald Trump has a pretty good record of trying to mess with the separation of powers, specifically the judiciary, by bullying. It's a very long, it's a very long history. 
It was done to Federico Messiah Jackson. It was done to Carolyn Engel Tamman, and it was done to others. And it was done by Lynn Abraham uh, in a vicious and rapacious way to try to force people to do things that violated their independence. That stops. It, the judiciary is independent. They don't have to go in the back and get told their statistics aren't good enough. They were elected to judge, and that's what they're going to get to do. Prosecutors have plenty of opportunities to make decisions about how to handle their cases that allow the prosecution to resolve issues if they don't particularly like what that judge is doing. But the judiciary is independent, and the DA is not and never should be in a position to coerce them or break their arms. Thank you. I do think there's a role for an investigative grand jury that is valid, but in general, the grand jury in police situations has been used by this office to make sure that police officers never get indicted for committing crimes. We all know what happens in a grand jury. There's no defense attorney allowed to participate, and the district attorney gets to lead the jury around by the nose. That's why they do it. They don't use grand juries for everybody who's not a cop. They use them for people who are cops. There is no need for that. If probable cause exists for a crime, not a mistake, not an honest mistake, but a crime. If probable cause exists for a crime, then an officer should be charged just like anybody else. We cannot have a double standard. We cannot have this political game of putting all of those cases in front of grand juries, telling the grand jury essentially not to charge, and then coming out and going, well, I did not charge him. It was a grand jury's decision, which is exactly what uh, our prosecutors have been doing basically my entire career. Let me follow up. Let's start with Mr. Krasner. I think there, there can be an important role for a special prosecutor. Uh, what has been done in other jurisdictions is they tend to bring in people from out of the city, and they bring in people whose job is only to look at public corruption and not to deal with police in other contexts. That can be a good approach. I will say this, though. As someone who's tried a lot of homicides, is very familiar with ballistics, knows an awful lot about civil rights, and has been involved in litigation involving police officers for 25 years, I bring quite a bit of expertise to the field. So while I see value in having a special prosecutor, I don't see value in having a special prosecutor who is somehow prohibited from having any input from a district attorney who has that kind of background. So I do see value in that process, but I have to tell you honestly, mostly what I see when it works well in law is character. It's people who mean what they say and are committed to doing the right thing. It's not some kind of process which people are awful good at getting around if they don't have good character. If we look at the rate of rejection of cases, because of course charging is done by the district attorney's office, but cases are investigated almost always by the DA's office, excuse me, by the police department. The police department brings the papers to the DA, the DA makes a decision. So if we look at that moment, when the DA reviews an investigation and decides whether or not to charge, the rate of charging is about 97 to 98 and a half percent. That compares to other jurisdictions not very well. There are many other jurisdictions where that rate may be 85% or 87% or 88%. And it is emblematic of the fact that charging has really been a rubber stamp in the city, essentially for my entire career. I think it probably is slightly better now, but slightly better is not much of an improvement. For example, do you know that even though we're supposed to have a system of dealing with marijuana possession as a summary offense, we have 600 cases a year that are brought simply because the individual who has the marijuana was seen purchasing it on the street, and they simultaneously arrested the seller. Don't ask me why. Maybe there's some world where we're going to cooperate these people for a little bit of weed against the street dealer, but of course they never do. They bring all 600 of those cases, and it's pretty typical of how insignificant cases that really shouldn't be in the system are brought into the system, and there is not a level of meaningful review. We need to have much more scrutiny, and if we did, I wouldn't have reports from judges one of whom told me that he had a summer in which there were 12 jury trials in his room and there were 12 not guilties. That should tell you something. It should tell you something about the level of performance, about whether things that are being charged are being screened carefully, about the level of training, about how well that office is doing. When you have acquittal rates like that, something is going wrong, and part of that process is the charge. We absolutely should go into a general fund because what we have now is a bounty system in which the DA's office keeps what it kills and puts it into a slush fund and runs amok with that slush fund. If you read that article, what you will see is it reports on some appalling behavior, but only as to about $1.5 million worth of funds that were seized, and there's another $5 million worth of data missing. Okay? The reality is that the civil asset forfeiture in Philadelphia has been a disgrace and a national disgrace. I don't know if you're aware of this, but Los Angeles and Brooklyn combined forfeited less than half of the amount that Philadelphia took and they represent 12 million people, and Philadelphia represents 1.5. It is an outrageous, rapacious machine for taking from poor people. Over a million dollars a year were taken from people who were never convicted, many of whom were never charged, 
and it was done in a mill where robo signatures were put on motions to take away $100 and $120 and $20 from poor people. That's what actually happened, $60 million over 10 years. Good estimate, half of it's stolen. That's what's been going on. So what you need to do is, number one, stop those practices, which are absolutely outrageous, and you have to move to a system where people do not have their assets forfeited unless there is an actual conviction. There are plenty of other tools available to deal with those other issues, but this is an issue of systemic corruption. Everybody wants to talk about $3,000 sofas. Everybody wants to talk about $46,000 roofs. How about stealing half of $60 million over 10 years? How about taking a million dollars a year from people who were never convicted and often never charged with anything just because those poor people couldn't afford to defend it? How about taking houses away from church ladies because their grandkids sold a $10 bag out of the basement, they didn't know a thing about it. You see, this is what the DA's office did. They took advantage of the fact that poor people do not get free counsel to defend assets. They only get it for crimes, and they buried them. I am opposed to the death penalty, and I say that not only as someone who has tried death penalty cases as court-appointed defense counsel, but also as someone who was on a death penalty jury as a juror when I was 23 years old and working as a carpenter before I went to law school. Uh, what I see with these cases is frankly outrageous. In the case where I was on the jury, we had a member of the jury who was mentally ill and was removed. We had another member of the jury who couldn't stop spouting racial epithets and derogatory epithets about other people on the jury, including about the defendant he advocated that we killed. Um, that's disturbing. That's very disturbing. And what makes it even more disturbing is when we actually look at the history of the death penalty in Pennsylvania, what we see is the last involuntary execution was 1962. But since the 1970s, there have been six people exonerated from death row during that time period, six people. We have spent, meanwhile, $1 billion since the 1970s pursuing the death penalty, even though it's never actually applied because that is how much it costs to have all those experts, the long trials, the appeals that go on for 20 years. We have spent a billion dollars on a death penalty that's not imposed while simultaneously discovering that at least six of the people on death row were completely innocent and would have been, frankly, killed by the state unjustly if the death penalty had gone through. I would rather take that billion dollars and turn that into 500 public school teachers a year since the 1970s, which is exactly what that money represents, exactly what it represents. And I am willing to bet you that if we had done that, we would have had fewer homicides and fewer murders. We would have actually had prevention of homicides. But that is not what we do. What we do is politicians say, you know, they, they rattle the sword and they say, I'm going to be tough. Let's kill people, even though it doesn't work. And they use it to get votes. Thank you. Um, this is an interesting question because, of, of course, both the federal government and the state and the county, all of them, have jurisdiction over a drug offense, just as they do over a gun offense that happens within the city of Philadelphia. So uh, the real question is, as a prosecutor, I mean, there can't be legislation that is going to authorize something that's a violation of federal law, so I'm not sure I understand that answer. But the bottom line is you have a choice to use your discretion. You can use your discretion to arrest the guy who's driving 120 miles an hour because the mother of his child's in the backseat having a breech birth. Or you can say, well, that behavior was fast and dangerous, but it was justified because it prevented a greater harm. This is called the defense of justification. You can also use that logic not to arrest someone who shot somebody else when that other person threatened his life. This is called the defense of self-defense. It's the law of justification. And we have a similar situation here. If you have idealistic medical professionals who are trying to stop the three deaths a day that we have in Philly, or the 13 deaths a day we have in the state, by allowing people to use clean needles in a safe environment where there is naloxone to bring them back from an overdose. I mean, you can prosecute those people, but to me, what you're doing is prosecuting people for minor offenses like drug paraphernalia or perhaps conspiring for the possession of drugs when the alternative is death. And it's the spreading of disease by dirty needles. And it's children walking down the street, stepping over those needles, maybe in their sandals, or seeing someone shooting up on somebody else's porch. You know, the whole point of being a prosecutor is to exercise discretion, and I would exercise my discretion to make sure that a responsibly conducted private effort to save lives by idealistic medical professionals and social workers and people in the treatment community who use that facility to get people involved in treatment are not prosecuted for doing what, to me, seems to be justified. Thank you, Mr. Gibbs, and thank you, Ms. Grossman. Ms. Grossman and I formed a bit of a bond during the primary. We weren't running against each other, which helped. But we did, in fact, form a bit of a bond. It's always a pleasure to be 
here with her. Um, so what we have actually seen since the 1970s has been a radical right-wing social experiment and prosecution. Charge and convict as many people as possible and then send them to jail as long as possible. This is a retributive model that makes things worse. We're in the land of the free and yet we have more people in jail than any country in the world, including many totalitarian regimes. There's more people of color incarcerated or on probation or parole than there were people in slavery at the end of the Civil War. I mean, this is amazing. It is unacceptable, it is out of balance, it is unhinged, and it doesn't work. It doesn't make us safer, it's unjust, it attacks our rights as citizens, it destroys public education, it destroys economic opportunity, and frankly, it increases inequality, racial division, and it undermines and destabilizes our society. In fact, this experiment, this prosecutorial culture, causes crime. For all the reasons we've said during this discussion, it causes crime by taking people out of the economic cycle, by causing a cycle of poverty, by making it so really the only thing that is available that will make the money is crime. This isn't just failing, it's causing crime. So we need to do something else. If we look at the characteristics of this prosecutorial culture, it's characterized by systemic racism, systemic corruption, attacks on the poor, abuse of the judiciary, contrary to the separation of powers, and know-nothingism, especially a rejection of science, namely criminology, which is never used, or at least not by this office, and should be. On so, you know, this is a, a real problem. You have a politics that divides us, it's based in fear, its political narrative reads like a comic book, instead of some sort of three-dimensional analysis of what's really going on. Now, if you think about the characteristics I just mentioned, do they remind you of our current president and a great big chunk, chunk of the Republican Party? Do they? Well, they should, because it's all the same stuff. Anti-science, know-nothingism, racial dog whistles. That is the tradition that we've had with the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office, and frankly, it's a national tradition. There's nothing special about Philly. Its failures are similar to failures all over the country. But it is time to unite and to reconcile people. It is time to go a different direction towards prevention of crime rather than retribution, intelligent policy, balance, science, progress, even-handed justice, toward defining justice broadly enough that we know it includes making sure there's money for public education, for drug treatment of a medical condition, which is addiction, for job training. We need to go where the grassroots are telling us to go. Thank you again for allowing me to speak on behalf of a movement for criminal justice reform. Thank you, Mr. President.